welcome to another episode of UC Sports Talk, the show where we love to talk about all things sport. I'm your host, Ricky Kelly, and joining us on the couches today, we have Chief Sports Writer of the Sydney Morning Herald, Zachary Gates. Afternoon, guys. We have leading statistician and sports analyst, Michael Piggott. Hey, man, guys. And also a very warm welcome to a man who's played cricket for Australia across all three forms. He took over 300 test wickets and averages 51.15 with the bat. He's known as the Ginger Assassin. Jack Howard, welcome to the show. It's good to be here, Ricky. So firstly, uh, a big welcome to the show, gentlemen. It's a pleasure that you'll be here with us today. Um, what a year of sport it's been. We've seen Leicester win the Premier League. We've seen the Cronulla Sharks win their first NRL uh, triumph. We've seen the Western Bulldogs finally break their drought. Um, given that we're kind of moving away from these winter sports now, I thought we'd move into summer sport and cricket uh, will be the topic today. Um, Jack, I'll start with you. Given that you've been lucky enough to represent Australia in all three forms of the game, um, how was how was a short term cricket come about um, since the 1980s, and what does this mean for Test cricket? I love cricket, Ricky. Always have, always will. And for me, my favourite form of the game is Test match cricket. It is the highest level of cricket you can play, which requires much more discipline and a higher level of skill than both One Day Internationals and 2020s. But at the end of the day, a game of cricket goes for six hours for five days. You need to really love cricket to be able to designate, or some people would see it, throw away 30 hours a week for a game. You know, um, and look, for a lot of people it's nearly impossible to develop a love for cricket when you're sitting down for 30 hours to watch a game which may well end in a draw. So look, one day internationals provide a more entertaining product of cricket which supplements the traditional five day game and appeals to a mass audience. The rise of one day international game really came about in the late 70s when Kerry Packer from Channel 9 couldn't secure the rights to the cricket from the ABC. So he decided to set up a rival product for his channel. Packer quickly learned that the professional cricketers were extremely underpaid, so he easily signed massive cricketing names from around the world to participate in his World Series cricket. As he had no obligations to follow set cricketing rules, his main focus was making his format as entertaining as possible in the aim to draw in crowds both on television and in the stadiums. It was only a matter of time until this was repeated again, making the game even shorter, promoting faster run rate, which generally leads to bigger hits and more wickets, which even mutual fans find exciting. So for me personally, it was absolutely no surprise when 2020s made their um, impact on the international stage in 2005. 2020s only last three hours, so it can be t t televised at prime time and makes a game more appealing to Australian sporting fans who are used to only sitting down and watching a game for two to three hours, such as AFL, rugby, soccer. And with the Big Bash, when Cricket Australia were setting it up, similar to Packer, they didn't have to follow any pre-existing rules. So they also solely focused on making their product as exciting and as appealing as possible. For us cricket lovers, I think we're fortunate enough to now have three formats of the fantastic game. But it's interesting to look at how the impact of the rise of the two shorter games has had on Test Match Cricket. The crowd attendances for Test Match Cricket, as we all know, fluctuate depending on the prominence of the uh, touring team. However, the average attendances against the weaker teams have dropped significantly since the introduction of the Big Bash six years ago. The value of Test Match Cricket quickly rose after the introduction of the ODIs back in the 80s because it spiced up the game and drew in more followers. But since the 2020 cricket has come in, Test match cricket has suffered. You know, the television ratings have dropped significantly each year since it came in six years ago. Yeah, well, I'll, just, I'll stop you there, Jack. It's interesting to note how, you know, when the ODI came in, you, you spoke about how kind of it made Test cricket come alive again. And then we've got this other introduction of, you know, this, this 2020, and then all of a sudden it's a case of, you know, convenience against tradition, where, you know, people are looking for a more convenient game to go watch. It's been a three hour block. They're kind of taking away, um, forgetting about the Test Match Cricket? Yeah, well, look, because Test Match Cricket is the traditional and most elite level of cricket, I think there's always a place for it, and it will always be around. All right, Zach, we'll move over to you. So how has how Australia sought to pull large crowds and television audiences? Yeah, look, Cricket Australia, formerly the ACB, has used a number of ways to pull large crowds and television and huge television audiences. Nearly all of the ways it's gone about attracting the masses were inspired by Packer, Kerry Packer, 
who essentially saved Test cricket in Australia through the excitement he brought to cricket in the form of World Series cricket. Day night matches, shorter formats, coloured clothing, big player signings from you know, West Indies, England, South Africa, you name it. Yeah, well, I guess, I'll tell you that, I guess that's what it's about these days, the attraction, you know, that attraction thing, you know, kids turning up to the games, they want to see the, you know, the flashing stunts, the dancing, you know, the cool names, you've got teams like the Brisbane Heat, Renegades, Scorchers, I mean, it's a good marketing team for the kids to come watch as well, and that's probably why it's drawing good crowds. Yeah, look, you've hit the nail on the head. All these things contribute to a more, you know, they contribute to a more captivating brand. Uh, of course, this excitement he created, you know, Packer created, attracted the revenue needed in order to subsidise the longest and oldest form of cricket. Coloured clothing was experimented with in ODIs throughout the 80s and was first a feature of the ODI World Cup in 1992, held in Australia and New Zealand. Since the early 2000s, all ODI cricket has adopted coloured clothing. The, the bright green and gold, you know, it, it lightens the atmosphere. You've then got other initiatives such as day-night matches contributing to excitement and in turn mass revenue. As a result of the booming success that day-night limited overs matches have brought to Cricket Australia, day-night tests have entered the scene in Australia. The inaugural day-night test was played in November last year at Adelaide Oval between Australia and New Zealand. Now look, it was a, cl it was a close contest between bat and ball, but the fact that it was at night, you know, it just... N night sport, it really livens the atmosphere. Um, and that's what we're seeing. Of course, the other way in which ODI cricket made for a more exciting product throughout the 80s onwards, for those not overly interested in test cricket, was in the, you know, was in the short format. As Jack touched on earlier, no longer did people have to watch 90 overs of cricket, of cricket a day for a maximum of five days, often to see the match even result in a draw. Of course, the limited overs led to faster run rates, more aggressive shots, more wickets, more boundaries, more aggressive positions in the field. Um, you know, and then look, so that's ODIs. We fast forward to 2011 and Cricket Australia has launched the Big Bash. A domestic T20 competition that runs for a period of you know, only about a month, four weeks. One of the biggest ways in which the Big Bash has brought excitement to cricket is in, a, is, is in its signings of some of the greatest players in world cricket to have ever played the game. Players like Kevin Peters, Jarvis Callis, Kumar Sangakara, Mahala J. Warner, Lassus Malinga, you know, even the controversial Chris Gale. It wasn't, it wasn't that controversial. Well, look, you know, that's, another, that's a debate for another time. <laughs> um, then we've had some of Australia's biggest names in cricket. Guys like Ricky Pontine, Shane Warne and Brett Lee. Due to a decreasing following of ODI, of ODI cricket, Cricket Australia identified that the format of a new domestic league would ideally be shorter. Thus, they ran with T20 cricket, which was proving to be a massive success in the IPL, the Indian Premier League, which started in 2008, as well as on the international stage. The Big Bash is also of the same format of a domestic T20 competition Cricket Australia had experimented, had experimented with prior to 2011, in which the various states competed. In a similar way to that of ODI cricket in the 80s, 90s and 2000s, the limited overs format of the Big Bash has seen bigger hits, faster run rates, you know, more aggressive field positions, more wickets. Another exciting development that has come with T20 cricket is shots that were never even a thought a decade ago. Shots like the reverse log sweep, the scoop over the head, the ramp, the switch hit, etc. Other ways in which the Big Bash has brought a lot of excitement, you know, a lot of captivation to cricket, is through team names and sponsors that capture the minds of, of their followers. Fireworks, light up stumps. But like, I mean, team names like the Perth Scorchers, Brisbane Heat, Hobart Hurricanes, they're exciting names. One of the Big Bash's most prominent sponsors is Zupa Duka. Right, well, Michael, being a leading statistician and sports analyst, uh, what's your view on uh, the decline in revenue within Test cricket, and what, is, what has Cricket Australia done to subsidise our much beloved Test cricket? Well, Rick, that's an interesting point, actually. Leading up to the 1980s, Test cricket revenue had risen dramatically in the sport. Australians began to watch TV around the world, around Australia, creating new and improved TV revenue. At the time, Cricket Australia was generating around $1 million per test match, 
from TV rights, deals, and viewership on TV. And though the players were only getting $1,000 per match, so that's really nothing for a whole year was worth of cricket. But professional full-time players like Dennis Lilly didn't believe that they earned, they needed more money to support themselves and they believed that playing full-time cricket they needed to earn a professional living. So in came Kerry Packer, Australian media tycoon, who believed, oh, I can make a really good profit out of this, you know, I can create a new league and help these players and pay them more and pay them what they deserve. Uh, as Jack, Elliott, uh, as Jack explained earlier, World Series cricket did define um, one day internationals and help develop one day internationals and these players flourished from this new form of cricket. Cricket Australia in turn did not like this because their star players were forming off to another league and they were losing money. So that's why Test cricket started to decline in revenue. And I'll, I'll hold you there Michael for a sec because I think, I think that's an important topic to discuss. I mean when you look at the start of the short game coming into the 80s and um, the, the revenue it's brought in um, you, you look at where would Test Cricket be now if that hadn't happened? Well Rick, with the added revenue Cricket Australia has recently found it, Test Cricket has been able to pay higher salaries in the recent future. As elite sport in Australia turned to professional level in the ni late 1980s, Australian cricketers were more common to play both Test Cricket and Monday International, providing these players more, had the widened skills of those areas. Currently, test cricketers are paid the highest amount in all the sport, so they're paid higher than the T20 players and the one-day international players, averaging around, annually around $900,000 a year. Many wonder how do Cricket Australia actually support these players with the big salaries? Well, the answer is 2020 cricket. Since the beginning of the big clash in 2011, Cricket Australia realised a huge potential for a massive revenue surge over a small space of time. Before the launch of the league, India Corporation bought 33% of all the Big Bash franchises. This is amount to a massive $60 million for Cricket Australia. In terms of TV audience, 1 million Australians are now currently watching each match per season, commanding a massive television revenue. Merchandise sales at the game and outside of the game are now up 44% from last season to 2.5 million. And the current television deal broadcasting is a substantial 5 million over the next five years. The upcoming season is best to, to generate a total profit of $5 million for Cricket Australia thanks to the expected $13 million from sponsorship deals. Cricket Australia 2014-2015 financial report pulled a revenue of $375 million, an increase of the previous year by 35%. This was due to Australia hosting the ICC World Cup in 2015, contributing to $51 million as co-hosts. With the increased revenue, the Cricket Australia Board outlined a long-term investment plan which includes subsidising traditional, the, the, traditional, tra, the traditional test cricket in areas such as enlarged salaries, maintenance of ovals and improvement of um, water facilities. Expenditure for one-day matches, expenditure for um, test cricket matches usually costs around $1.5 million for Cricket Australia to hold. And having a crowd of 20,000 people just doesn't cover the costs. So to clarify the recent decline in test cricket revenue and the uprising of the evolution of one day internationals in the 1990s and the 20, T20 Big Blash League in 2011, generating a superb surge of revenue, this is a fair assessment of elite level cricket in Australia since the 1980s, leading up to now the present. In recent years of domestic T20 cricket, dictate the cricket Australia's revenue in the future, Hopefully the future of the new now international T20 cricket can replicate and increase potential profits for um, cricket in the future. Well, once again, gentlemen, thanks for coming on the show. That's all we have time for today. Um, once again, I'd like to thank also our viewers who have tuned in to watch our show today. Today's been a more educational topic um, and discussion. We've kind of gone in depth with our analysis and talked about cricket and how test cricket has probably been since the 1980s subsidised through um, and from the short game through big TV rights, um, huge crowds, um, and that's probably what we've come to as a fair assessment. Um, that's all we have time for. Thanks for tuning in. I'm your host, Ricky Kelly, from Now UC. Goodbye for now.